By the late 19th century, mathematics in one form or another was making regular appearances in fiction of all types, but especially that dealing with technical issues. Conan Doyle brought it into his mysteries, most notably when his master detective Sherlock Holmes needed to draw on a knowledge of geometry or cryptography. Later authors, however, have noted a few maths and science bloopers in the Holmes tales. In The Final Problem, Holmes says of his nemesis, Professor James Moriarty, At the age of 21, he wrote a treatise upon the binomial theorem which has had European vogue. As Isaac Asimov pointed out in a chapter of his book The Roving Mind, 1983, Moriarty would have been 21 years old in about 1865. This was 40 years after Norwegian mathematician Niels Henrik Abel had fully worked out every aspect of the binomial theorem, leaving Moriarty with nothing new to find out about the subject. H.G. Wells, who along with Jules Verne was one of the early heavyweights of science fiction, delved into mathematical descriptions in several of his novels. Early in The Time Machine, the time traveller announces to his colleagues, I shall have to controvert one or two ideas that are almost universally accepted. The geometry, for instance, they taught you in school is founded on a misconception. He then goes on to explain how a four-dimensional geometry would work and adds that Professor Simon Newcomb was expounding this to the New York Mathematical Society only a month or so ago. In fact, American astronomer Newcomb had indeed lectured on the fourth dimension to the New York Mathematical Society in December 1893. It was this very lecture that inspired Wells to imagine, in his 1895 novel, a time-travelling device moving in another dimension at right angles to the other three. Wells returned to the theme of higher dimensional excursions in a short tale called The Platner Story, published a year after The Time Machine. Gottfried Platner, the central character, was a young teacher in a prep school in Sussex. One day, bored while supervising a group of boys doing their evening homework, he decided to test a mysterious green powder that one of his pupils had brought in for analysis. Platner knew next to nothing about chemistry. He taught mainly modern languages, and so tried various tests at random. After the addition of nitric, hydrochloric and sulfuric acids failed to elicit a response from the powder, he put a match to a sizable pile of it. The next moment there was a huge explosion that blew out the window of the classroom, sent the students scurrying under their desks in fear of their lives and, it seems, caused Mr. Platner to vanish into thin air. For more than a week, the mystery of Platner's disappearance endured. Then, just as suddenly as he'd winked out of existence, he came back, crashing with a thud into the headmaster of the school who was out in his garden doing some weeding. Over the next few days, a bizarre fact emerged. Everything about Platner had been swapped right to left. He'd become the exact mirror image of his old self, left-handed instead of right, and with all his internal organs, liver, lungs, and so forth, switched around. Just as we could pick up a two-dimensional right-handed glove, flip it over in a third dimension, and put it back down to become a left-handed glove, so the curious inversion of Platner's right and left sides is proof that he has moved out of our space into what is called the fourth dimension. The pulp era of science fiction magazines which began in the US in the 1920s and the golden age of SF which followed and overlapped with the years of World War II produced a torrent of fantastic tales about the future. These imaginings ranged from the truly awful to the inspiringly creative and were marked by a shift away from the often long-winded romanticism of Victorian and Edwardian literature to hard science fiction with a focus on theories, technology and scientific veracity. A smattering of maths, at least, found its way into many of these science-based tales, 
in the guise of adventures in a fourth or fifth dimension, calculations needed for faster-than-light travel, or musings on infinity. Some of the new hard SF had mathematics as its central theme. In Nathan Schachner's The Living Equation, 1934, a mathematician builds a machine that's designed to transform purely abstract objects such as vectors and tensors into physical reality. But before he has a chance to test the invention, it's inadvertently tripped into action by an intruder at his home. The consequences are disastrous. Whole buildings move or disappear. Their inhabitants suddenly finding themselves plunged into an alternative dimension. Land masses vanish, oceans are swallowed up, and time slows down or speeds up in different parts of the world. Behind the story is a serious philosophical notion, namely that maths represents the ultimate reality in which we're embedded, while the physical universe is merely an illusion that dances to whatever mathematical tune is being played. Greg Egan explored similar territory in a 1995 short story, Luminous, which tells the tale of two graduate math students who make the astounding discovery that what had been thought of as ultimate truths in number theory are really far more local and temporary than expected, changeable over time and in competition with other truths that apply elsewhere in the infinite reaches of the numerical cosmos. Mathematics and philosophy go hand in hand too in some of the short stories of Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. The Library of Babel, originally published in Spanish in 1941, supposes the universe to consist of a vast library containing all possible books of a standard size, 410 pages, format and character set, with 22 letters, the full stop, the comma and the space. Every combination of these characters subject to the other constraints appears somewhere in the library. Inevitably, only a tiny fraction of the books contain even short passages that make sense. On the other hand, everything that has been written or ever could be written, including everything fictional, even if it purports to be true, and factual, crops up somewhere in the mind-bogglingly large and utterly useless collection. Huge numbers of combinations of symbols are also central to the plot of The Nine Billion Names of God, 1953, by Arthur C. Clarke. The monks of a Tibetan monastery hire a computer and two programmers to speed up their task of encoding, according to their belief, all the possible names of God, each of which consists of no more than nine characters. Doing it by hand, they reckon, would take about 15,000 years. Electronic automation ought to drastically reduce this, and the monks are keen to get the job done, because then, they say, God will bring the world to an end, and we can get on with enjoying whatever comes next. Sure enough, the computer zips through its task in just a few months, and the programmers head for home, leaving the monks to paste the final few names into their holy books. As the Westerners make their way along a mountain path toward the airfield and their journey back to civilization, confident that their task, though complete, has been mercifully futile, they pause to look up only to see that, overhead, without any fuss, the stars were going out. Clark, Isaac Asimov and George Gamow, like Asimov, a Russian émigré who became an American citizen, were prominent among qualified scientists who, beginning in the 1940s, wrote essays and books on both science fiction and science fact. Sometimes they fuse the two, as in the case of Gamow's four books featuring Mr. Tompkins, a bank clerk engaged to the daughter of a famous physicist whose dreams transport him into realms where physical constants are altered so that he can better understand relativity, the world of the atom, and modern cosmology. In the same era, especially in the post-World War II years, writers with a strong mathematical background started publishing popular material that sometimes crossed over between fact and fiction. 